So, hi, Linda. How are you doing today? Hi, Anna. I'm very well. Thank you. It's really nice to see you. And thank you so much for um, coming on here and, um, and allowing me to talk with you and interview you about um, you and your life and your work. Um, I'm happy. Cool. It's going to be a special for everybody who's going to be listening. So as you know, we are doing this series for um, our participants and actually other people in prison um, that we work with. And so there's many people in there who, who won't know who you are. They may have heard your name, but they haven't seen your face and they don't know who you are. So I would love you to just um, introduce yourself and say who you are and what you do in the world. Um, and then we can go from there. Well, you know, it's, it occurs to me I, to say it sounds corny, but I'm just a person. I'm just, um, and I, 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 uh, very, uh, I was very fortunate in that I ran across this understanding when I did of the three principles. Um, my first career, I was a, I, I was a nurse. I was an RN and I, I, I worked as an RN for about five years and then I, went into psychology and I was studying to be a traditional psychologist when I ran into Sidney Banks and that and listening to him turn my world upside down and here's what matters to me the reason that I went into psychology is I was looking for how people could change because I, I I wanted to change like I I felt like there was too much wrong with me and so I wanted to find out how to change for me. And then I wanted to help other people change. And I didn't find that answer in traditional psychology, but I found it listening to Sid Banks. So I've been a three principal teacher for 40 years now. I'm pretty old. <laughs> um, are there specific populations of people you work with or anybody? Or what's, the, what's your... your and anybody anybody but it's interesting because we don't try for any particular population they find us so initially we started working with couples on the verge of divorce my husband my husband and i are partners in marriage and partners in business and so when we met sid we were on the verge of divorce and meeting sid we were able to flip our relationship from bad to good and so what we started doing that make, made sense to us was working with people on the verge of divorce. And then um, this businessman, he worked, we worked with him and his wife. And he, um, he said, well, gee, you know, this applies to any relationship. I want you to work with my general managers. He had an, an advertising business. And we said, well, we don't work with businesses. He says, oh, no, no, I'm bringing my general managers up and you're going to work with them. So that's how we started working in businesses. And then we did that for years. And then all of a sudden, and then we got worked. Um, and then all of a sudden, we Orthodox rabbis started coming. And we started working with the Orthodox rabbis for years. But it, so it's really, it's been really, and then everybody in between, any, anyone that darkened our door. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm actually really curious though about relationships because I'd love you to talk a little bit more about what, what if you were on the verge of divorce, because I know there's a lot of people, well, especially, not especially anywhere, but there's a lot of people obviously who are struggling in relationships. Um, I was going to say, especially in prison because they're apart or whatever, but still, regardless, what you were on the verge of divorce, what did you see or what changed that allowed you to flip your relationship or saw yeah. something that you flipped your relationship? What happened? It was an insight that I got from talking with Sid. I, I happened to be up on Salt Spring Island in this little restaurant. Salt Spring Island is where Sid lived, and there's this little town called Ganges. Very back then, it was very small, and there was this little restaurant that I went in to get some lunch. And Sid and I were the only two people in the restaurant, so I asked him. I got very brave because even though, you know, he, he I loved he was helping me. I was kind of afraid of him, you know, intimidated by him. So I got very brave and I went over and I said, can I sit down and talk with you? And he said, and he always called women dearie. He was from Scotland, he would say, oh, of course, dearie. So I, I sat down and I had two questions that I, that were very personal questions to me. And the first question was, 
said, you know, I used to be happier than I am now. And it seems like, and I, I was like 25 then, maybe. And it seems like every year I get a little less happy. I don't understand. I don't understand why the older I get, the less happy I get. And he looks at me and he says, do you know what the feeling of happiness is, dearie? I said, yes. He says, do more of that. And I'm like, I didn't say this out loud, but I'm saying this in my mind. That's it? That's all you got? And I was like, kind of like, what kind of thing is that to say? But I didn't because I respected him so much. You know, I just kind of buttoned up and I went, oh, okay. And then I asked him my second question, which was, you know, I just don't think I can be with George anymore. I just, you know, all we do is fight. You know, we just argue and fight. Not physically, but mentally. We just fight. And it's no fun. He said, well, did it used to be fun? I said, yeah. When we were first together, I mean, we had a lot of fun. We really enjoyed each other. So he says, you know the feeling of enjoyment? I said, I do. He says, do more of that. I'm like, again, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. This is what you tell people? So I thanked him. I mean, I was, <laughs> I was so taken back, but I thanked him and I walked away. And as I was walking, I remember the exact, exact spot between on the path. As I walked out the restaurant door towards my car, in the middle of this path, the pennies dropped. And I went, oh my God, he's right. And I realized my first realization was that I was looking to fix the world and fix myself before I could be happy. I can't be happy unless things are fixed. And I realized I had to be happy independent of circumstance. To be happy independent of circumstance. Because if I base my happiness on circumstance, circumstances change. So circumstances would be jerking my happiness around all over the place. And I realized I could be happy within my mind, within myself, independent of circumstance. And then the second penny dropped. Well, of course your relationship is horrible, Linda, because all you do is look at what's wrong. And all you do is try to fix him like you try to fix everything else. So you come across very critical. Nobody wants to be criticized. So if you want to have a good relationship, you have to switch from constantly criticizing him to looking at what you enjoy. And that's what I did. So I did. I started looking to what to enjoy. I went back to the feeling of enjoyment and looked to what to enjoy with him instead of looking at what was wrong. You know, always being preoccupied and thinking about what was wrong. I stopped doing that. Now, there's no perfection here. It's not like I don't do that sometimes. But, but the, the real, the, what's, what's important is I don't agree with that when I do it. I don't think I'm on to something like I did before. When I was critical, I thought I was on to something. And so how did he notice the difference? Like if he was, he was learning this understanding alongside you, what did he see that looked different? You know, I don't know. I don't know. You'd have to ask him. Okay. Isn't that funny? We've never had that conversation. Huh. Yeah. But clearly he saw something. Yeah. Because he, as soon as I started to look to enjoy him, he got right with the program. And so I know, you know, these things pop up in my head and I'm thinking about, you know, relationships and I'm thinking, you know, some relationships just aren't healthy. Some relationships, you know, the, the do get physical and some relationships aren't, aren't healthy because what you're saying isn't, isn't like, you know, you need to look for the good in everything and then it's going to be fine because I'm sure there's also um, relationships that aren't healthy to stay in. So how would you speak a little bit towards kind of just, you know, your own experience, but also, um, you know, there are some circumstances in the world that are going to make it better for people not to be in those relationships. Well, here's the deal. 
you know, everybody has to decide for themselves because goodwill, love, good feeling can change, can, in, it, it, it can entice, it can, if you have goodwill and love and towards your partner, in spite of their behavior, in spite of them being difficult, it can pull them, they can change and pull, you can pull them into that feeling. Okay? They, because people, I think people want love. They want, they want to be, they want, they want to be loved and they want to love. It's like people want to be loved and they want to love. Now, sometimes it doesn't look that way because of their behavior, because their emotions or their reactivity gets away from them and then they act on it behaviorally, you know, and, and they can get mean psychologically or they can get mean physically. So people can get into a reaction and get mean. But in my mind, People want to be loved and they want to love. And so you can, you can try it and see if you, if it, you can do it. And, and people say to me, well, when should I stop? You know, when sh when's enough is enough. Like I have love and goodwill and they're still, you know, they're still really, really difficult. And I said, well, you know, it's up to you. When you give up on them, it's up to you. And there's no right or wrong. Don't judge yourself. Don't judge yourself. And if you feel like you don't want to do this, you don't want to try and flip your relationship, you don't have to. You're not required. There's no law. But, you know, so you need to look inside and see if it's something you want to do because love can change people. Love can, you can change your, you can flip your relationship with love and goodwill and giving people the benefit of the doubt and, forgiveness and compassion you can flip your relationship it's just a matter of how much time you want to do that until they change and whether you want to do it in the first place whether you think it's they're worth it it's pretty simple it's pretty practical yeah, yeah. And, and so then when you started working in business and started to see different types of relationship did you see a similar um sort of different dynamics of relationships change or how what did you see there well, relationships are relationships, you know, and some are more, you know, they're, they're, they're different in that, you know, there's, there's personal relationships, there's business relationships, but business relationships are still personal. You still get caught up with people, right? People are impatient or condescending or they're um, difficult. They go off on you. Like I had my gardener go off on me the other day. It was because, um, you know, my husband, a year ago, he had um, open heart surgery and then he had a stroke, a bad one. And um, so with the coronavirus, I've been a little more cautious about social distancing. Like I do 12 feet instead of six feet. And so my gardener is coming at me and, um, you know, and I'm moving away from him. And he says to me, well, it's only six feet. It's only six feet. I said, well, you know, I just can't do another hospitalization. You know, like I'm frightened right now. I don't want to, I, I don't want to do it. I've just been through a year of doctors and rehab and, I don't want to go in the hospital again with George. I don't want to. In fact, if he has to go in the hospital, I can't go with him. So I'm doing 12 feet. He gets so upset and he just runs off. Right? Now, a lot of people would fire a gardener that did that, right? Or get mad back, you know, start yelling back. But, you know, He's a good guy. He just has trouble in relationships, you know? So when I got back in the house, I texted him and I said, you know, I'm really sorry that um, I have to do 12 feet, but I, I, I don't know that you understand that I just, you know, getting over this whole 
thing with George, it was very hard and and um, I'm feeling very protective and I'm really sorry if that's offensive to you. And he texts back and says, no problem. But I know that he's, um, he has, he's, re he's very reactive. But I don't have to, you know, I don't have to take his reaction seriously. No, I don't. They, he surprised me. I mean, I would never react to my employer like employer like that. But you know, it's like I want to have goodwill. I want to have goodwill towards people. So, just talking about you know, it sounds really tough. Just this last year with open heart surgery and. And then it sounds like George had a stroke afterwards, um, which then, you know, just exacerbated everything. How I'm curious how the understanding um, that we're talking about, how how it helped you navigate your way through all that. Well, in 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 th two or three ways. One thing the understanding did for me is that when I would get upset or in reactions, like I get my feelings hurt or I get mad, it would take me ever to get over it. So I would hold on to things. The understand me allowed me what I call in my own words, my own vernacular. It's like, I feel like I can jump my thinking. I can jump my reactions. I like that. Get very reactive and then I just like spring back over it. Like jump it. So I can get very upset. And then a few minutes later, I'm fine. Because it was super upsetting that George had a stroke. Well, it was super upsetting that he had to have open heart surgery. But we were very hopeful about that. And in fact, the surgeon came out and he was tickled pink. He's like, George had the best surgery. It was just so successful. It was just perfect. It was like we were all happy and, and went to bed that night in a hotel near the hospital. And then, you know, I got the call at five in the morning. Your husband had a stroke. And I, I ran. I ran to the hospital and I ran into his room and I looked at him and I said, hi, babe. And he said, hi, babe. And that the fact that he could recognize me, because I didn't know if he could, but he could. But that's about it. He couldn't, he couldn't do my, he lost most of his, like 90% of his ability to speak, 90% of his ability to comprehend, to understand what people were saying. He couldn't understand what you were saying. And it's called aphasia. And then he, um, he could move his right side but he couldn't use his right side. So he couldn't stand. So he couldn't rehab from the cardiac surgery because you're supposed to stand and walk right away. And so I get into worry about, well, how's that gonna work out if he can't, if they can't rehab him because he got the stroke. So I get in, and then he, couldn't have painkillers, you know this, they. They cut open your sternum and they spread your ribs apart. Ugh. He couldn't have painkillers because of the stroke. So it would get, it would be hard. It'd be, the, you know, it'd be, I would get into my thinking about all of this and my worry. And then one of the things Sid said, you know, he said, there are deeper feelings in everyone that they can access. Everyone is filled with deeper feeling. But the thing is, see, we stay on the surface in our intellect or emotional reactions too much. It's where we live in our thinking and our emotions. He said, but underneath that, we have wisdom and we have deeper feeling. Well, I just took a dive into the feeling of hope and hung on. Because I knew that, that we have deeper feeling underneath our emotional reactions and underneath our, inter, underneath our intellect. I just went to the feeling of hope and I stayed there. 
And, it, and here's this, the thing. It wasn't for any specific thing. I didn't have the feeling for any specific outcome. I had the feeling of hope to light my way. And I had the feeling of hope because it stabilized me. So I was very hopeful, very optimistic, and I didn't listen to the naysayers. Oh, don't get too hopeful, dear. Don't know what's going to happen. I wouldn't listen to that. Oh, it's going to be really, really hard. I wouldn't listen to that. And with the hope and the, with the optimism, it was like George and I were the perfect rehab couple because he was willing and I was optimistic. I'd say, come on, George, you can do this. Because he had so much, he had to relearn things. Get this, this is fascinating to me. He didn't know what up and down was. So I'd say, put the dishes up, you know, up in the upper cupboard. You go, what's upper? I'd say, it's the one that's on top of the lower. He says, what's lower? You don't, you don't understand that upper and lower is something you learn. It's a concept. You learn as a child. You learn upper and lower. It's a concept. But you forget that you know these things, these simple things. He didn't know. I had to... I, he had to relearn up or lower, up and down. What's up, what's down? And this is down, in this direction is down, in this direction is up. He had to relearn time. I showed him a clock and he said, what's that? Wow. I said, well, this tells time. I had to reteach him time. He had, now he didn't have to re relearn some things came back, like he couldn't read. And then all of a sudden he started to be able to read again. Um, and he didn't know what things were like. He'd say to me, he'd say, well, he was in the hospital for a month. He'd say to me, I feel like a stranger in a strange land because I just don't know what things are. Can you imagine? Yeah. You'd look at things and you wouldn't know what they were. Like you'd look at a book and you'd go, mm, you know what that is. But it's been a journey of up and down and it's been required me to find strength that I never knew I had. Because not only did I have to rehab him, but, but I had to take over our business. You know, he was basically the leader in our business. I had to become the leader in the business. He couldn't work. I had to work, I, which I did. I love my work, but I had to rehab him work and take over the business and the finances and then, you know, the, it, it, um, he, and he got the, he got the coronavirus. He, George got coronavirus as well. Jesus. And um, so, you know, it's just been kind of one thing after another. And I just, um, I don't think about it. I don't think about it. I don't think I just do what I need to do. And stay in the feeling of hope and optimism. And but the thing is that when people people would say to me, I, I can't believe people would say, oh the gifts of the stroke. You know, there's gifts, there's gifts. And I'd be like, Yeah, you have a stroke. We'll switch places and you can have this gift. You know, I didn't say that to them. Because my mother, my mother raised me to be polite, right? So I, you know, I wanted to say that to them. Well, why don't we trade places and you just go ahead and have this in your family? You know? But it's true. There have been many gifts. 
many gifts. He, um, we are so close. We have never been closer. And we have so much gratitude for each other. It's just thick with gratitude. And um, his work is deeper with people because he does the same thing I do. And his work is more essential when he works with people. I don't know, it just, um, it's built character in, you know, it's been character building for both of us. I find that um, I know what I, I'm not as I'm not as uh, confused about what's important and what isn't important in life. Mm. Life looks very simple to me, and to George. Um, I'm tired of being locked down. I'd like to get out more. But you know, I get over that too. I just, that's a thought. I just get over it. I have a beautiful garden that I can go into, but I don't, um, you know, I have to bring George with me because I still, um, sometimes his, um, his balance can be a bit off and it would be, it would be terrible if he fell. So, you know, I have to, I can't stray too far from home unless I bring him. So I, I'm, I got a, a question from when you, when you were, and, and this is again, it's about George. So I should be asking him this question too, but I find this fascinating that he had a stroke and he forgot what, or he had to relearn things like up and down and clocks and stuff. But what it sounds like, he he still had an understanding of the mind. He still, like, it, it seems like his his experience through this and your experience through this, you know, I know that you, obviously yours is very different, but that was intact, like that his his, his understanding oh, yeah. of his mind. And I'll give you an example. So I we sometimes I forget that he's had a stroke. I forget. Because we'll have an amazing, and this isn't just now, but early on, when he didn't know what a clock was, we'd have amazing conversations. And from wisdom. And then I'd say, George, what time is it? He'd say, well, what's time? And then I'd go, oh, yeah, <laughs> you had a stroke. <laughs> crazy it's amazing how we kind of you know as bob would say rise to the occasion and it just feels like there's been a lot going on for you and i'm i'm just curious like you know there's so much that's been been going on and that you've been in this work for 40 years and so it sounds like you know you found some you know deeper gratitude and 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 lots of things that it's is there anything that you you knew like anything fresh insights that you've had through this that have been like really profound rather than what it sounds like is just deepening everything that you you kind of know well i didn't realize that hope could be so helpful hmm. that hope could be a foundation and I didn't that and it wasn't hope for anything particular. I didn't appreciate the relevance of optimism. Because see, if optimism, it sometimes it looks like optimism is making things happen, but it optimism optimizes possibility, see? If you're optimistic, it optimizes the possibility. Like that. Pessimism, you'll never get there. But optimism gives you a chance. Optimism can open doors. You know, optimism can ignite the spirit. Optimism, like George, when he was 
in the hospital because he did not, like nine out of 10 people in George's situation um, get diagnosed with depression and go on medication, nine out of 10. Open heart stroke, the, the double duo, they go on medication. And um, when he was in the hospital, because his attitude was so good, he got into the best uh, rehab program. Because his doctor saw it and said, oh, I'm gonna get you in this program. Because attitude matters if you have a stroke, it matters. So a lot of people, see they get discouraged. This wasn't that George didn't get discouraged at times, but he did the same thing I did. He'd jump it, he'd get over it. But a lot of people with strokes, they get discouraged and then just stop rehabbing. They just wow. sit in the corner. Yeah. Just go, I'm not doing this, it's too hard. I'm not doing it, it's too discouraging. But he did not let discourage the feeling of discouragement stop him. And the surgeon saw that and 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 basically went to bat for him to get him into this program. See, that's why optimism, optimism matters because people will bet on an optimistic person. People outside will, will get behind someone that's optimistic. But, uh, you know, the other thing I thought is, you know, this, this happening this last year is made me live in the moment in a way that I never have. And I thought, wow, why can't people just live in the moment? And I'm including that, in, I'm including me and people. Why can't people just live in the moment? Why do they have to have something really bad happen to them that requires them to live in the moment? Very puzzling. Did you find an answer? <laughs> No, I don't. I mean, I think you'd have to see something deeper, you know, because we get so enamored and, and, and compelled and hypnotized by our, our thinking. We just, we have thinking and we just go, oh God, I got to look at that. Oh, I got to think about that. You know, we get particularly negative thinking or insecure thinking. It's just, it just, it, you know, we just move, moves us. It just, stimulate us stimulates us jars us to look at it and i think if you had a deep deep understanding of it like sid banks did you just wouldn't you'd stay in the moment mm. that's just my thinking about it i don't know yeah. i love that though i love the i you know just you know with everything going on right now and 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 it's like i know for myself it doesn't help me to stay in the in the noise and the anguish and the and the destruction. Oh no! You know why? You know why? See, I couldn't stay in anguish. I mean, I went into, you know, anguish, and my life is over, such as it is. My life is over, and if I thought too far ahead, I could go into thinking like, well, what am I going to do with him if he doesn't come back? You know, what what, what can I do? So I could, but which I, which I closed down because it was way too future thinking and I knew better, right? But I, I went into anguish and despair and I went, can't think straight from there. No good thinking in there. And I had to think clearly because I had to pay attention because I had to negotiate his rehab. I had to understand what he was up against and what he needed to do. I had to be present. I had no business being in anguish and despair because I had to think clearly about what to do next. See? Because hmm. that kind of bad feeling, you can indulge it for a few minutes or maybe a few hours, but you got to get out of there if you want to move on in a way that you can think straight and think creatively. I like that. I just, it's like, I just want to absorb that. What else do you want to know? 
um so I'm just, I, I just, I find that really, I just find that really helpful. And I also find it hopeful because it kind of is reassuring for me because it's like, yeah, that, that place, you know, that's, that's like anguish isn't helpful and, and, and residing in hope is a, is a more, is a, is so much more helpful. And I find for myself so much more helpful thinking and possibilities come out of there. So, um, I, uh, I, I, I I know I had a question actually from from Miles before um, about traditional psychology, and 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 so you're um, you know you have both you have both backgrounds so you know and this is the the the, the, the kind of path you 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 saw for yourself that was more helpful. Where do you think, from your perspective, knowing a lot about it and studying it, where do you think in any of these situations that traditional psychology like um for you know didn't help like you said you didn't find the answers there or you didn't find solutions there and i'm just curious like what, what because there's so much attention on traditional psychology and i know that you know this direction is so much more helpful but what would you say because you have a lot more knowledge around it well there's, i'd say a couple things one thing i think traditional psychology helps depending on the psychologist if you get have a loving wise compassionate therapist psychologist counselor that's going to come through that's what's going to help not the techniques that's what's going to help if you have a therapist that has common sense you know traditional therapist with common sense it's going to help and the, but the thing is, the, the thing I saw is that what really mattered, the difference, the real difference is originally psychology was not split off. The spiritual was not split off from the psychological. And what happened is that Sid brought back to me the psychological and the spiritual. You can't have just, you can't just deal with the, the person's psychology. You have to, you have to understand spiritual that people are have a spiritual nature and in that and their psychology comes from that spiritual nature i mean they have a brain they have an intellect you know part of the brain um so you know we learn and we store information in our intellect so that is kind of seen as our psychology and where traditional psychologists work in in the brain in in the cognition with the cognitive but we have a deep spiritual aspect of us we have a soul we we are spiritual beings and the principle of thought comes from our spiritual nature our consciousness comes from our spiritual nature and so you that's what i realized that was the answer we change that's where change happens. That's where change happens through our spiritual. I've never talked like this before. Um, that's where, where the change happens in our spiritual nature. That's where the insights come to change the psychology through our spiritual nature. That's how you change through the spirit. You understand something deeper or you let the spirit take over and not be so much into your, into your, Co cognitive abilities or your past see the past because people believe in the past the past is dead the past is just memory brought into the present so traditional psychology believes in the past that's just memory so you're working with memories leave them alone bury them forgive them put them away they're gone they're just memory brought into the moment you don't have to leave them but but you find change within your spirit, your ability to change within your spirit. That's what I found. I love that. It, when I first when I first came into prison, um, and I had a conversation, I was trying to get into prison, and I had a conversation with the chaplain at one of the, the men's prison, and and we were talking, and he really heard something, and he said, you know, in the fifteen years I've worked in criminal justice system. 
I, I've seen that where change comes from is in, is in here. It comes from somewhere deeper and it comes from our, comes from our spiritual nature. Now, I know you, you're not talking about it like that, but I know what you're drawing out is coming from the same place. And so it's going to help people that maybe wouldn't have a religious kind of... Um, well, I found, like, I went into the prisons, with, years ago, I went into the prisons with Kathy Casey. She asked me to come in and speak to the, in the men's prison. And I was struck at how deeply they were connected with their spiritual nature. Now, it was just one time, so I can't say, well, you know, all prisoners are connected to their spiritual, spiritual nature, but those 60 guys that I talked with, they were just so connected to their spiritual nature. It was in impressive yeah yeah i find that a lot yeah and it's that's where i learn for sure and it seemed to me it's just that they have the only problem they had is that they would act on their they would act on their emotional reactions or their psychological reactions they would act on them behaviorally and that's what would get in tr them in trouble you know and so that's why they were in prison because they were acting on their reactions and they didn't they were learning not to that they could have their reactions and just let them go and they didn't have to act on them but you know everybody in some way or another acts on their reactions it's just like like i'll get impatient with george and i'll act on that impatience and i get harsh and it hurts his feelings it's the same thing. It's just that I'm, you know, I'm not going to get arrested for it. But it's the same concept, see? Yep. When you act on negative, when you behaviorally act on negativity, some of that behavior can get you thrown in jail. And some of it just can break up a relationship or a friendship or get you fired from a job. See? So say you act on start acting on things, you, you learn not to act on your negativity, your negative reactions. It's all, it's that simple. And people can, you can, you can, really can, if you want to, you have to want to. Well, I think that's an, I think that's a perfect place to to wind down. Unless you have anything else that you'd like to say, I think that's a that's a perfect place to stop. Well, I I'm very thank you for asking me. I just I love helping people, so thank you for asking me to do this webinar. Thank you for agreeing to do it and joining me it's been a really fascinating conversation and i've really enjoyed it i hope people find help in it and you know my favorite book is the missing link by sydney banks it's just full of treasures and um and also his recordings that you can listen to his recordings and the thing about listening to Sid is you don't want to listen to his words. You want to listen to him in a way that you pick up on his feeling. You want to listen for his feeling and go up with it. We take some recordings in and we've got, we've got a, a fairly healthy stock of the, the missing links. And actually some other books as well. It's been nice. We, we, we get some, you know, um, so are you getting are you are you getting results are you guys getting results oh, amazing yeah we, we have a, we well just it's that simple like what you said is that when you when people see that they don't have to react to a bad feeling their life changes yeah yeah and it's that simple like you were saying and so it's it's like you stop reacting to bad feelings and you look in a different direction everything changes and so you get you know you have a better experience in prison you have you realize one of the youth the other day who is who just you know is incredible because we're doing still doing zoom calls with the youth it's like he said you know i realize freedom is a state of mind and i didn't know that and it changed everything for him he's a very he's well, that's a, very profound 
thing to say. Actually, George had that experience. He talked about it um, on the one in the London conference. He said that he said he he, he had the thought that he's I'm not going to be able to do seminars again. You know because I can't talk mm. well enough. And he said when he had he said when he came to peace with that he realized. He said it gave him mental freedom. He said, I could do anything. I'm free. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's the same. It's, and that's where you realize no one's different. And so, you know, you can find freedom in prison. You can find freedom in the outside. You can be imprisoned on the outside. You can be imprisoned on the inside. But it's, it's, I think that's what people see. And I think that's where the freedom comes from. Because also when you, and I love that. I've never kind of heard you say that before. When you jump your feelings or when you jump, you know, a kind of a, a limiting thought even, like, oh, I can't do that, or I've got this label, or I've got that label. You start jumping that and you realize that anything's possible. So when people come out of prison and they, they realize that anything is possible, they're only limited by a thought that they take seriously. But beyond that, they've got it. You just start seeing people doing amazing things. And so, and once you start seeing it, that that's possible, it's like a superpower and everyone, you know, you just kind of, you go from there and and it's not that people don't have their bad days, but they don't take them so seriously. And so the, the results that we're getting is people are staying out of prison, they're doing well, or if they've got long sentences, they're not getting into trouble and they're getting, you know, they're not going to the hole. And then they're, you know, we had one woman who, um, who was in prison for a really long time. And she had a thought about wanting to bring education to the women's prison because it's more prevalent in the men's prison. There's not nearly as much education in the women's prison. And she didn't think that she could make a difference. And, she, and after coming to our program, she started to see that, well, she could speak out and she could say something. And so she started, she wrote a letter to the senator and she did stuff and he came to the prison and she talked in front of a bunch of people and she was blown away the fact that she could do that. And so she's brought, you know, they, she started a, peer, a group of, of people who are now bringing um, education, higher education into the women's prison. And it's like, she did that because she believed that she could do it. Things like that happen. No, but that's amazing. It's, it, it gives me chills. I mean, that's just so amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I learn every day. I see things that I just constantly, it's like my, my, you know, learning playground of seeing, you know, people just come have such wisdom and such profound insights that. Um, Did you speak at the conference in London? Did you speak? No, no. How come? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think we're, we're tucked away in Portland. So I, I just get on, have my head down and I do my thing. So I'm uh, out of the way, which I, I kind of enjoy to be fair. I like having Barb, you know, cause Barb's on our board and, and she, you know, she helps with our teacher training and stuff. So I really appreciate having, um, but I, I kind of find myself busy with my head down and, and, and so I, I don't really know what's going on really. So, um, but uh, it's, um, yeah, I, I, I love it. So, I, and I, and I love doing these and I, and I, you know, we haven't actually spoken much. And so I really appreciate having the time to, to hang know. out with you. And I know, I've talked to you in years. I know, I know. I was saying that to Charles actually. It's like, God, the last time I actually probably spoke to you was when I was doing the One Thought training, which was back in 2013, um, mm. which was crazy when we just, just started to go into prison with Jacqueline when she yeah. first started going in. And then, yeah, and then, yeah. so it's, a, it's been a while. It's been a yeah. while. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I learned to jump my thinking as well, which is so fucking cool. Oh my God. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm gonna press end on this recording because I just continue recording. But I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you. Oh, I, I, I was just more than pleased to do it. Yeah. Just, you know, so I um, people. It, they're not getting the, I mean, I'm, with the exception of you and a few other people, they're not getting the help they need in prison. They're not getting the assistance. They're not getting, they're just, it's just not good. The prison system is not good. It's making things worse. And 
you know, there are people there that don't need to be there. And yeah, it's terrible. It's just terrible. And, and if we can help them learn to just negotiate their thinking, they'll be fine. Yeah. 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 I mean, some of them won't be able to, but well, I think the majority of them will, you know, I mean, it should just shrink the prison population yeah. over time. Mm. Yeah. And it, and it gives them the, the agency to fight their cases too. We got a woman who, who's actually fighting her case to get out and because she now believes in herself, you know, so it, it, even though, you know, I sometimes think, oh God, I wish we could change policy. I mean, we're partnered with an organization called Oregon Justice Resource Center, which is doing a lot to change policy around bigger, you know, like systemic change that, you know, we're changing kind of from the inside out, um, it, you know, one person at a time or one group at a time, which then gives people agency to change their lives. And I love that there's people working in policy. So I think that doing all of this is, is so helpful for well, change. Yeah, because if, if people can, the, the only thing that's scary is the, um, how many prisons are privatized? Well, we were just having, funnily enough, having this conversation yesterday. And I mean, the, the, the prisons that I work in aren't, aren't private prisons. Because um, of, as prisons, they make money and they don't want to. You know, they want customers. <laughs> I, just, I, I know, I know. And yeah. also, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of private companies within, within public prisons that make a lot of money, like, you know, Telmate and all the different, the communication systems are so expensive to make phone calls and the, the things that you pay for through private companies, even if a prison isn't private. So, you know, it's, it's there's so much business that thrives off, you know, Prison. prisons. But if people could, if people changed and could make it, went to prison and changed, it could make a case for, look, I've learned my lesson. I don't need to be here. Yeah. If they could, you know, put them on parole. We're working on it. There's, and, and, you know, it's, it's, um, yeah. I mean, people, one thing that we, you know, that, that we're in our relationships with parole officers, parole officers, um, both federal parole and um, state parole officers who see that people who come through our program are doing better and that they don't have to, in terms of their caseload, they know that, that there's something that's deeper that's changing, so they don't have to worry about them. So just before coronavirus, I had had a PowerPoint presentation, which I, ne I needed to talk to the federal um, prison um, kind of uh, parole sort of higher people to talk about why our, you know, to give a state of what a statement of why our program is needed for other people, in, for other people's caseloads that are coming out of prison. So having a, a program out of prison, for, you know, because the, like I said, the parole officers seeing that the people that come through our program are doing better than anybody else. Um, and so they want so that that kind of thing is happening you know it's just slow because we're a small organization and we're doing we're putting one foot in front of the other and doing as much as we can you know but um it's it's uh you know that's why i just got my head down and doing doing, doing the work and and i really enjoy it well i'm more power to you and, and i i gotta go because i gotta yeah I got another call but hey thank you and it was not really nice to see you it was really nice to see you too thank and say hi to george and wish him well well, he's doing great. I'm sure. You know, oh, don't even know that he's had a stroke. I bet. I bet. I can imagine. I can they, imagine. Don't, they don't even know that he had a stroke. Yeah, that's really cool. Oh, yeah. that speaks a lot about both of you. So um, well done. And uh, yeah. it was lovely. And have a, have a great summer. You too. Take care. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye.